and welcome to our uh, webinar, Nanul the Funding for Clinical Stage R&D. My name is Mitchell Weiss. I'm a Director of Business Development at the Freemind Group. And uh, let us begin. So uh, a bit about the Freemind Group. Uh, we've been around for about 18 years now, since 1999. We have 60 full-time employees in a pretty diverse client base. Uh, academic institutes, uh, university medical centers, independent research institutes, and the industry. Anything from very early stage startups all the way up to some of the uh, lar large uh, pharma companies uh, that I'm sure you've all, heard, you've all heard about. We submit around 500 grants and government contracts on behalf of our client base every year. And uh, Basically, FreeMind is a tool uh, for you to maximize your funding potential, identify the most relevant funding opportunities for you, strategize and maximize the application's chances of success, manage the complex project production processes, lead the joint application writing, and support the final contract negotiations. And uh, today, we will be talking about non of funding for clinical stage R&D. So um, the annual pool of money that we're referring to is about $50 billion. Most of it comes from within the NIH, which is a part of the HHS. The NIH itself is uh, a combination of 27 institutes and centers. Just uh, as an example, uh, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, NIDDK, National uh, Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, NINDS, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, NIAID, National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, we have the Mental Health Institute, National Institute for Bioimaging and Bioengineering, National Institute for, um, um, sorry, uh, the, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, and the list uh, definitely goes on and on. Um, so, um, of course, other than the, the uh, NIH, there are other HHS organizations, uh, BARA, the Biomedical Research and Development Authority, the FDA that I'm pretty sure you all know, uh, CDC, NSF, the National Science Foundation, and the list is, again, uh, it goes on and on. Another um, uh, agency that we uh, gladly target is the Department of Defense, or the DOD, including the U.S. Army, uh, DARPA, DITRA, the CDMRPs, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs that we'll definitely talk about uh, within this presentation uh, and, and many more, uh, U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command, and of course private foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Michael J. Fox Foundation, and uh, many more. And um, this is the pie chart for the NIH budget for 2017. Uh, it's about $34 billion, a little over that. But what I would like you uh, to see within this chart is the fact that the vast majority of the NIH budget actually goes out to fund extramural research. So um, this is the actual pool of money that we're referring to if uh, we're talking and we're focusing on the NIH. And by the way, the reason that I'm, I'm beginning with... Um, uh, with the NIH uh, is just because their budget is, is by far the largest. So uh, this is the categorical spending of the NIH. You can see it's listed, uh, the, the indications are listed. If you'll take a look at the far left side of the graph, you'll see uh, that they definitely invest a lot of money uh, in clinical research and just uh, some figures uh, for you to look at. So for 2017, uh, clinical research and clinical trials uh, put together range a little over uh, 50, 15, sorry, billion dollars, uh, and that's for 2017 uh, alone. So this is definitely uh, not something to shake a stick at in terms of the sums that we're talking about. And um, if we'll take a step back, uh, the NIH definitely um, funds all stages of development from very early stage discovery level funding all the way up to clinical stage phase one, phase two, three, uh, and on some occasions uh, even beyond that. And uh, if we'll uh, talk about the sums of money or the awards that we're uh, basically targeting, so 
Uh, on the far left, we can see that for early stage projects, the awards are usually from two to five hundred thousand uh, dollars. Moving up to more advanced stages, about half a million to about three and a half, and large scale projects are of course over that. Um, but most importantly, the award is meant to cover uh, the, the costs of the project itself. So, of course, if you're planning something that's still a preclinical, still, uh, you know, uh, playing around with the test tubes in the lab, um, the, the, the amount of money that you'll be awarded is, is definitely more than enough for you to do that. Uh, but if you're talking about a phase three clinical trial, getting a five, uh, $500,000 is very nice, and, and thank you NIH, but that will of course not be enough for you to complete the work that you're planning. So they do try and make sure the award reflects the scope of work, and, and we'll talk a bit about that as we uh, continue. But one other element uh, to bear in mind is the probability uh, to succeed. So um, in terms of, uh, and I suppose, uh, the, the stage of development uh, and the amount of opportunities out there, for early stage uh, projects, we can definitely find a lot of opportunities. And um, the reason for that, if you'll think about it from the NIH's point of view, is that the amount of money that they will be investing is, uh, well, not that, you know, not that robust. So uh, the risk on their end is lower, and, and of course it is a risk assessment uh, process. So you can see that they have more opportunities for early stage projects, and as um, the, the, the R&D process continues on, we can see that there are less opportunities, each one of them, for uh, a lot uh, more money, but um, I can tell you that for the late stages, the success rates actually go up. So this is definitely something uh, to think about. Um, and I would like to talk about a few of, I suppose, a typical, uh, a few typical mechanisms uh, that are used for clinical trials. So first of all, we have the phase two or the fast track SBAR. And I also uh, listed down uh, the, um, uh, basically the, the way the NIH writes it, so the, the code. So you have the R44 or the U44. You have uh, the R01, which is the research project grant. Uh, that is a pretty significant mechanism within the NIH. Uh, they do a lot of clinical stage projects, and supporting, of course, uh, a lot of clinical stage projects. Uh, another thing is the cooperative agreement, or the U01. The phase cooperative agreement, which is the UH2, UH3, that funds uh, late stage preclinical uh, trials and early stage clinical and uh, BAAs, or Broad Agency Announcement. And that's, of course, uh, not only NIH. And um, before we'll dive into the specifics of each one of them, I would like to, I guess, uh, devote this slide to talk about a few important elements that we can definitely see across the board for all of them. So first of all, uh, a clinical protocol is usually a necessity at this point um, and, and, you know, the goal is for them to make sure that you do know what you'll be doing with the money when you'll be awarded. Another uh, nice to have is an investigator brochure. If you have your clinical sites, if you'll know where you're, you're about to conduct uh, the project, so definitely list that as well. Uh, if you already have the site PIs, uh, that's also wonderful. And uh, the next thing is an IMD. So um, I can tell you that over the, the, the last few years, we definitely see that the IMD has uh, a lot of impact if you'll take a look at you know, the, the, um, your chances to be successful. But uh, recently, it became a requirement for both the NIH and the DOD, and we can definitely see that this is becoming uh, a requirement for all of the funding mechanisms that fund clinical stage projects, uh, basically to make sure that you are good to go. They are investing a lot of money, we're talking tens of millions of dollars, and the most important thing for them, which is pretty intuitive if you think about it, is to make sure that they're investing in projects that will be successful. And an IMD is, is definitely 
a good uh, a good way for them to predict whether or not you're ready to basically go. Uh, of course, an IRB is also um, a, a nice a nice thing to have. Uh, it's usually not required at the time of submission, and uh, and of course I, I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, it is very important for you to contact the PO or the program officer of the program before submission. You really want to make sure that this project is something that they're interested in before they review the application, both uh, because these people are definitely here, there to help you. And bear in mind that their goal is to fund uh, projects. So you really want to make sure that you are talking to them, that you are uh, taking the time to let them uh, give you some advice. Uh, and secondly, um, and, and for those of you that have experience with writing these things, um, I'm sure you know that um, completing, a, completing an application is not something that you do uh, very easily. It takes a lot of time, there are a lot of guidelines, and you really want to make sure that you're not wasting your time preparing this and then uh, submitting it to a place that it will not be appreciated. So again, our recommendation is definitely to talk to the program officers before submitting. So uh, a bit about the NIH itself, the National Institute of Health. Um, their goal uh, in this aspect is, is to fund the projects. So in order for them to do that, and because they are investing large amounts of money, they also have a type of grant that's called an R34 for clinical trial planning. Basically, um, the activity supported within, within these grants is the establishment of the research team, development of tools and data management, and research uh, oversight, development of a trial design, finalization of the protocol, preparation of an operations or a procedures manual, and pilot studies or collection of feasibility data for subsequent research projects. Basically, the goal is for you as a research team to be ready with all the requirements before submitting the clinical trial grant. That uh, is wonderful because all the steps that are listed here are very time consuming and sometimes very expensive. So uh, the fact that they are definitely uh, taking that into consideration and uh, the fact that they have a grant for that uh, is definitely something that we find very useful and uh, recommend uh, for you uh, to utilize. Um, very generally, usually uh, these type of grants are up to $450,000 over the period of three years. And uh, again, they're designed to make sure that um, uh, you are ready to submit the clinical grant. They permit early peer review of the rationale and concept of the proposed clinical trial, support the development of essential elements of the clinical trial, lead an application for support of a full-scale trial based on elements developed under the planning period. And um, these are just a few examples of our 34, 34 sorry, uh, grants. So um, we have one for the National Institute of Aging Clinical Research a project planning grant. Uh, we have one for the National Eye Institute, the NHLBI, um, a few uh, for AIDS, um, NIAMS, NIGDK, and the list definitely goes on and on. If you go into the NIH website and you'll uh, search for R34 or U34, you'll find 27 results. Um, basically, um, and the reason that I'm telling you this is not because I, I know how to count. Uh, it's just to show you that these uh, type of grants are definitely something that is important to the NIH. They are investing a lot of uh, time and effort to make sure that the grants that you're submitting as a part of your clinical trial um, are accepted, are funded, that the projects are within their scope, and they are very, um, very user-friendly. They are very much uh, happy to help. And um, so a few, a few uh, elements regarding the NIH clinical trial funding. So um, 
Basically, if we're talking about uh, SBIRs, and uh, just as an example, I use the NIADS SBIR, Facebook Clinical Trial Implement Cooperative Agreement, or the U44. Um, so the scope of the, the, this project is uh, historically $1.5 million for a phase two, but um, they are able to increase that, and um, they usually do. So again, make sure that you are aware of that option. Uh, in terms of the scope, basically uh, it supports work within uh, the mission of NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, these type of grants um, are both hypothesis-driven and milestone-driven, meaning, of course, the science is critical and, and ultimately uh, the thing that wins awards is, is good science good innovation uh, fill projects, uh, but you also need to have it milestone driven, meaning uh, if you have specific aims, you need or they need to be able to track that throughout the process. Um, in terms of uh, the funding, and um, this is uh, another type of project called uh, a EO1 or a cooperative agreement uh, with uh, the NIDDK. And, uh, and a cooperative agreement uh, is very similar to, um, to a grant, but it's a bit more hands-on, meaning they will be there for you to support you, help you steer the project. Uh, um, and, and of course, this is done with you. A lot of our clients, a lot of uh, people that we talked to told us that it is incredibly helpful. So uh, this is definitely something uh, that I would suggest. Uh, the next due date for that is October 5th. And um, just a few other um, opportunities uh, that I just listed. Of course, we don't have to go through uh, all of them. I just wanted you to really see that it is incredibly diverse. Um, look up your, uh, your field, your indication uh, within the NIH website. Uh, and, and of course, uh, feel free to, uh, um, to contact me and if you need any help with that, uh, but it's it's pretty intuitive, uh, highly recommendable, recommended, sorry. Um, so these are a few opportunities uh, for the CNSPNS um, related uh, work, uh, a part of uh, the NANDS, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. They do a lot of clinical stage uh, work. They support a lot of clinical stage projects, both for anything neurological and, of course, anything stroke related. And um, in terms of stroke, uh, they have a project called StrokeNet that uh, is basically there to, to help uh, advance research and uh, development uh, within, uh, within, sorry, uh, the field of stroke. Uh, they also have another wonderful project called NeuroNext that uh, supports anything neuro-related. So again, uh, the internet is full of, of uh, great things uh, to look at. Uh, just make sure that you are familiar with that. Um, and these are some more uh, opportunities. We have UO1s, we have UH2 and UH3. And uh, definitely um, in terms of anywhere within the scope, anywhere within the stage of the R&D, there are wonderful opportunities out there that you should definitely explore. Another um, very important element or a uh, funding mechanism and funding agency that uh, should definitely be uh, mentioned here is BARDA. BARDA is uh, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority and basically the mission of BARDA is to develop and produce medical countermeasures that address chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear accidents. Uh, and basically make sure that the U.S. citizens are uh, protected. We have three solicitations open uh, at, uh, at this time. Uh, the first one is very, very general uh, advanced research, research and chemical, biological, and nuclear medical countermeasures for BARDA. I, uh, I added the solicitation number. Another thing or another solicitation uh, is uh, to uh, advance and uh, research uh, pandemic influenza. And uh, the third one is for advanced research and development, uh, expedited 
and identification, development, and manufacturing a medical countermeasure against infectious diseases. So these are the, th the three bar solicitations. They have a rolling deadline, meaning you can basically uh, submit. Uh, but bear in mind that um, the, the way uh, the bar review process works is a little different if you compare it to the NIH. It's phased uh, and basically divided into two. The first stage is called the pre-application stage or a white paper where you basically submit a very short summary of the work that you plan on doing. You send that over to them and then it is reviewed uh, by their scientific team and then hopefully invited to submit uh, the full application. That is uh, a bit longer, of course, um, but once you submit, you've submitted that, uh, it is reviewed again and uh, hopefully awarded. But bear in mind that uh, the most critical stage within the process is the stage one white paper. The white paper submission is the first and one of the most critical steps for the award, typically two pages long, but the majority of applications do not make it past the white paper stage. Basically, that means that if you're called to submit a full application, your chances increase dramatically. So um, our recommendation is definitely uh, to craft your white paper, ensuring your science is well presented. Uh, don't disregard the importance of the white paper, although it is a very short document. Uh, you know, every, every word counts. Literally. Uh, a bit about the FDA. The FDA has um, an orphan drug um, uh, mechanism to support clinical uh, stage projects of rare diseases or conditions. Basically, they fund stage one, two, and three, usually up to about $2 million. The next up is the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, or the CDMRPs. That is a part of the DOD. Uh, these come out once a year, usually around the spring. Um, this year, uh, they actually just, uh, they were just uh, announced about a month ago. Uh, they were a bit busy in Washington, so uh, it was delayed uh, just a teeny tiny bit, which is wonderful because the deadlines uh, for the CDMRPs are definitely, uh, uh, definitely here and uh, definitely around the corner. Um, so uh, they basically divide the, the projects that they fund into four stages. Phase one and two are for preclinical stage, and I took the liberty of uh, discussing level three and four. So usually uh, level three is about uh, $4 million plus indirect costs. Make sure that the money that you're allocated goes out to fund the work that you do. Level four is up to 10 million plus indirect costs. And uh, very broadly, uh, level three is for advanced translational studies that have the potential for the near-term clinical in investigation, uh, small scale compared uh, to level four. And uh, level four is, well, of course, the large-scale projects uh, that will transform and revo revolutionize the clinical management and or prevention of breast cancer. So uh, these are, of course, uh, example. I, I, examples. I use the breast cancer indication um, that are that is, is definitely uh, one of the flagships uh, of the CDMRP uh, mechanism. And um, yeah, so that's um, that's regarding uh, just uh, the breast cancer. Uh, the CDMRP program is divided to indications. And a very important mechanism within the CDMRP is the pre-reviewed medical research uh, program, or the PRMRP. They uh, issue a list of topics, and this is the list for 2017. Uh, please don't start reading everything now. I'll be very happy to, to send you the presentation uh, once you're, we're done. And um, the reason I listed everything is for you to see how, um, how specific and how uh, diverse their interests are. So uh, these are just a few examples. Um, and I wanted to talk a bit about the NIH uh, review process. I told you this very briefly before, but uh, although it is a scientific uh, grant, 
it is a risk management process within the NIH. They have to make sure that the risk is not as high as the strength of the application, and they use five review criteria to review their application. The first one, the most important one, is the scientific approach, where you basically uh, list what it is that you plan on doing, uh, the work plan, the hardcore science, the protocols, and uh, with that, we couple the innovation part, making sure that you are suggesting a project and you are addressing something that is important, that is significant, but you also have to do it in a very exciting new way, if, of course, if you want to be successful. Uh, the next one is the leadership. Who are the people that uh, will basically uh, help this project materialize? They have to be people that... Uh, definitely can be trusted by the NIH reviewers to see the project through. And uh, last but not least is the environment uh, element, making sure that you are uh, conducting the project in an environment that is suitable for the type of work that you're suggesting. So for example, if you're talking about a very microscopy based project and you do not have uh, you know, a confocal microscope or uh, anything uh, more advanced than that, um, it will not look very well, very good uh, in the application. If you're talking about a multi-site project and you do not have uh, multi-sites, uh, that will also not look very well. And um, I guess uh, in order to maximize your chances with all of these uh, types of, of mechanisms or with non funding in general, um, our best advice from about 18 years of doing this is to have a very systematic approach. Know the interests of the agency. Read the solicitation. Make sure that you understand what it is that they're looking to fund. Make sure that you're not wasting your time submitting a wonderful project to an agency or a mechanism that cannot appreciate it. Uh, make sure that you're presenting a complete focused application. You have to remain within their scope. You have to make sure that you're offering a project, again, that is suitable for them. Ask for what is necessary, and this is actually a pretty critical uh, element, especially when we're talking about large amounts of money. If you're asking for too much, uh, you might come off as unprofessional or uh, as someone that uh, wishes to basically take more money than needed or greedy. But if you're asking for too little, you might uh, appear as someone that doesn't really understand what it is that they're facing. And that does not look uh, good either. So uh, as, as you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, the first part, making sure that you're not asking for too much is, is uh, pretty intuitive, but you have to make sure that you're not uh, portraying yourself to be someone that doesn't really understand what are the true costs of the project. You also, um, a good uh, a good thing to do is to leverage our research collaborations. If you have everything you need within your team, that's wonderful. But if you're doing a kidney-related project and you do not have a kidney uh, expert, that uh, might be problematic as well. And it doesn't um, make your research group seem less professional hiring a consultant or a basically having a member of the team, even if the member is external, that can help you um, lead the project. And of course, you have to target the right mechanism. Remember that there are different pockets of money, different sizes of awards and success rates. You have to conduct a very thorough strategic assessment and um, basically have a multi-submission granting strategy, meaning submitting to as many agencies as possible, as many mechanisms as possible, as many deadlines as, as possible. Use the reviewer's comments. Use the summary statement. Make sure that you are uh, utilizing all the tools that they provide you to really make this a good uh, strategic source of funding for your organization. And uh, just uh, very briefly regarding Freeman's professional process. So uh, we basically uh, do two things. Uh, we do a strategic assessment and uh, help you produce the project itself. 
We help you conduct a long-term ter strategic approach, outline projects, and the tasks that need to be completed. We'll link you with existing pockets of money, browse through solicited and unsolicited opportunities, and uh, map the relevant uh, funding opportunities as well. We, uh, in terms of uh, producing the application itself, we help with the project, uh, the pro sorry, project management uh, part. We help you coordinate between the different parts taking part within the project. We create comprehensive templates. We uh, base those both on the specific solicitation guidelines and our many years of experience in both submitting and, of course, screening these things. We uh, basically begin an ongoing feedback and edits process to make sure that the application itself has everything uh, that's needed. We help you manage the budgets and converge the information uh, and basically uh, end up with the final outcome, which is a single coherent presentation of the work that you plan. Uh, and these are definitely ongoing throughout the entire process, both the strategic assessment and uh, the, the production of the applications, of course. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, a few uh, comments. So uh, the slide deck is available in the uh, handout section here if you'll go to uh, the bottom part of uh, the, the tiny window that you have there. You'll see the presentation there. Um, and I do hope that some of you at least will attend bio. Uh, you are very welcome to meet us there. If you're interested in some uh, FaceTime, some 101, please uh, contact Irina, which is I-R-I-N-A at freemindconsultants.com. She'll be very happy to set up some time for you with one of our experts. And um, if you've enjoyed this and you want some more, uh, the next webinar is on June 5th, and it is an introduction to the SBR SCTR program. I will send you the link uh, in the chat part of the window. We're definitely utilizing the window today. And uh, you can also find the link uh, and some more information on our website. So um, let me take a few questions, just a minute. This is a very small window. Hold on. Bear with me. Um, okay, so I have a question regarding the Cipri uh, grant in Texas. Uh, yes, we definitely uh, submit uh, these types of grants uh, as well. Let's see. Um, I am not a U.S. citizen. Can I still apply? Definitely. So although there are programs that are a bit more uh, focused on U.S. companies, U.S. organizations, uh, U.S. citizens, uh, for example, uh, the SBR and STTR program, a lot of the clinical stage uh, programs are definitely open for non-U.S. Uh, citizens as well, uh, non-U.S. entities. Uh, if you're uh, conducting your work within the U.S., that is also a great plus, but definitely there are opportunities for non-U.S. entities uh, performing, preferring the, sorry, performing the work um, outside the U.S. as well. Okay, so uh, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Sorry again for the, for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Uh, and uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions. Thank you so much and have a great day.